Greetings from the World Health Organization in Geneva and the Eastern Mediterranean region. Today we will explore three questions. What are the implications of emergencies for children's healthy growth and development? How do we ensure children receive nurturing care even during an emergency? And what resources exist to help those working in the health sector and beyond? Let us remind ourselves of this concept called nurturing care, something I think you've all heard about by now. To reach their full potential, children need the five interrelated and indivisible components of nurturing care. Nurturing children means keeping them safe, healthy and well-nourished, paying attention and responding to their needs and interests, encouraging them to explore their environment and interact with caregivers and others, Nurturing care is not only important for promoting young children's development, it also protects them from the worst effects of adversity by lowering their stress levels and encouraging emotional and cognitive coping mechanisms. During emergencies, it is vital that we support parents, intimate family members and caregivers to care for themselves and continue providing nurturing care for their young children. While all children in resource poor settings can face immense obstacles to achieving their development potential, young children in humanitarian settings are especially vulnerable to physical, developmental, mental and emotional threats. The compounding risks to young children's development stem from a continuum of experiences that may include forced displacement, migration, and resettlement to a new setting, such as a refugee camp or integration within host communities. These experiences are likely to result in mothers, fathers, infants, and young children having limited access to preventative and curative health services. High risk for malnutrition, elevated levels of insecurity, violence and stress, and other potential effects arising from socioeconomic adversity or extreme poverty. Young children living in crisis contexts face prolonged and excessive stress activation, such as toxic stress, that can alter their brain and body chemistry and have detrimental and lifelong negative implications. Research shows that access to nurturing care can ameliorate these threats. For the youngest children, a healthy and supportive relationship with a caregiver is the primary source of resilience. Refugee families and families in emergencies, however, face many obstacles to meeting their children's needs. When caregivers are coping with loss, insecurity, depression, and adversity, their ability to positively engage with their children becomes hindered. This results in an equity gap that begins in early childhood and widens into adulthood. What we seek to ensure during an emergency is that the protective factors are in place and that caregivers are able to continue providing care for their young children. But how can we ensure children receive nurturing care even during an emergency? This brief entitled Nurturing Care for Children Living in Humanitarian Settings highlights actions countries must take to strengthen nurturing care and minimize the impact that emergencies have on the lives of young children and their families. It calls upon all relevant stakeholders to invest in evidence-based policies and interventions that have been shown to build resilience and mitigate the harmful effects of emergencies. Here are a few examples of the actions described in the, in the brief. The actions are categorized under Remember, Strengthen and Add. Remember because there are actions that we are already doing that contribute to children's development and they must continue but we must also take a critical look at what we are doing and understand where the gaps are and fill those gaps. Very often we are focusing on life-saving interventions, but we are not looking at the protective factors or at the types of interventions that would actually support children's development. So we need to conduct rapid response assessments to understand the needs of pregnant women, young children, and their caregivers. And we need to update existing policies and plans to ensure they give continued attention and financing to all five components of nurturing care. We also need to think about what needs to be added. There are many individuals that are working directly with caregivers and their children. 
what can we do to boost their capacity so that they are better able to support caregiver well-being, including the caregiver's mental health, as well as strengthen the caregiver's capabilities to provide nurturing care for their children. For example, how might we support the capacity of the frontline workers to promote caregiver-child interactions that are playful, that are nurturing, and that are responsive? This brief from Moving Minds Alliance outlines seven actions that need to be taken, not only to respond to an emergency, but also to prepare for an emergency. It includes actions such as increasing funding, strengthening coordination mechanisms for the planning and delivery of services, and leveraging existing platforms that already reach infants, toddlers, caregivers, and pregnant women. It stresses the importance of mental health and psychosocial support for caregivers, because we all know that if the caregivers are in poor mental health, they will be less able to care for their young child. Let's turn our attention now to the available resources developed in the Eastern Mediterranean region to support and protect the development of newborns, children, and adolescents in humanitarian settings. The World Health Organization has an implementation framework for improving the health and development of newborns, children, and adolescents in the Eastern Mediterranean region. The framework has three strategic areas, of which the second one, the one on the right, specifically focuses on humanitarian emergencies. There are several actions identified under this strategic area. They include, among others, ensuring proper representation of newborn, child, and adolescent health in the emergency coordination mechanisms, obtaining and reviewing data on newborn, child, and adolescent health, and using these data to prioritize actions, including specific newborn, child, and adolescent health indicators when measuring the effect of the emergency response, and strengthening the capacity of national authorities and local communities to manage newborn child and adolescent health in emergencies. In follow-up to this implementation framework, there are two guides which I will speak of next. One focuses on newborns and the other focuses on children and adolescents. This field guide for newborn health complements guidance provided by the 2018 Interagency Field Manual on Sexual and Reproductive Health in Humanitarian Settings, IAFM, for building sexual and reproductive health, including maternal and newborn health, along a comprehensive care continuum. The guide focuses on the unique challenges surrounding the 28-day neonatal period following birth, and it seeks to reduce neonatal morbidity and mortality in humanitarian crisis situations by providing recommendations on critical life-saving activities that can be introduced relatively quickly without specialist training in advanced newborn care. The guide provides guidance to program managers on how to initiate newborn health services during an acute phase, as well as how to enhance and expand these services over time as the setting allows. The Operational Guide for Child and Adolescent Health serves as a companion to existing guides on newborn and sexual and reproductive health in humanitarian emergencies. The development of the Operational Guide was informed by a rapid review to identify the gaps in the current approaches in responding to child and adolescent health during humanitarian emergencies. The review emphasized two points, one, diversity, and two, existing resources. On the first point, diversity, the rapid review drew attention to the fact that there are different types of emergencies of different duration and different phases. There are a variety of actors involved who may be doing similar or different things, and the political environment changes from one emergency to another. On the second point, existing resources, the rapid review drew attention to the fact that there are many existing resources that are not being implemented. Reasons for this could include that they are not accessible, have not been disseminated to the users, are not appropriate to the context, or are too complex. The rapid review therefore recommended that the operational guide be relevant and useful for health and non-health actors, and that it bring together existing information rather than generate a new resource that duplicates or competes with existing resources. Hence, the operational guide 
is a synthesis of existing guidance, not a new guideline or program, and it incorporates existing standards and guidance and documents and presents them as a simple systematic approach together with links to tools and resources to support action. The operational guide is structured around four key programmatic actions. These programmatic actions are part of a continuous cycle of activities. Each area of action is intimately connected with the other areas, and activities within each will often occur simultaneously. And these four areas are coordinate, assess and prioritize, respond, monitor, evaluate, and review. In times of crisis, urgent actions need to be taken. However, it is important to think about how our actions are directly or indirectly influencing the caregiver and the caregiver's ability to care for their child. This may be happening directly or indirectly through policies, services, or in the surrounding communities. It is important, therefore, that we take a holistic approach to ensure that whatever we do, we are responding to the wider set of needs that caregivers may have. And this may include providing financial stability and social protection to address immediate livelihood or nutrition needs, maintaining integrated child and family services, including essential health services, supporting caregiver mental health through social support and or stress reducing activities, and promoting and supporting positive caregiver child interactions and playful parenting. We all know that parents are the ones who are best placed to provide their children nurturing care. But in the time of an emergency, their ability to do so becomes severely compromised. These are headlines that were in newspapers or articles during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you could see how much strain and pressure was being put on caregivers during this time. So in an emergency, parents deserve urgent support. Most importantly, this is true for families who are already financially or socially challenged, but all parents need some support and some parents need all the support they can get. So how do we make sure parents get the support that they need and when they need it? We recommend three levels of support to parents according to different levels of need as shown in the pyramid. At the top of the pyramid, are intensive interactions, combined in-person group, maybe digital outreach, for those families who need all the support they can get. The next level down is targeted support for families at risk of developing bigger problems, which can involve family and group-based sessions, such as home visits or community groups, and digital outreach, perhaps Zoom, phones, apps, chat groups. The third level down is the universal support, the types of support that would be essential for all parents. And it would be done through the integration of parenting interventions into routine services, such as health, nutrition, childcare, social welfare, and through multimedia population-based dissemination channels, such as radio and TV newspapers. Remember, we want to make sure that parents are supported. And some parents will need some kind of support, other parents will need different kinds of support. When we do our rapid assessments, this is when we can understand what kinds of support is needed and how best to offer that support. I'll close by just showing briefly here four resources that may be of use to you as you go forward. Each of them includes guidelines or practical recommendations on what you can do, particularly in health and nutrition services, but could also be adapted elsewhere to enhance universal support for parents to care for themselves and their young children. These recommendations have been developed for parents in every situation in every part of the world, but they become increasingly more important in times of an emergency. For more information, we encourage you to look at the Nurturing Care website. And we thank you for your time and encourage you to continue creating the enabling conditions for caregivers to receive the support they need so children can receive nurturing care, even during an emergency. Thank you.